All right, part two, we're back. So, we were talking about the meaning of names according to the spelling, and we happen to mention Nicodemus, or Nicodemon, as in John 3.16, as in John chapter 3, where Yeshua is having a conversation with this man. But numerous times in the Tanakh, the Almighty giving his name is yud heh vav He or Iawa or Yahua or Yahua, different ways to pronounce it. He mentions that he is this Elohim of Abraham, Elohim of Yitzchak, and Elohim of Yaakov. And quite often he'll say it just like that. I'm the Elohim of your forefathers, your Avviot. Or he'll say, I'm the, Ab the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, the Elohim of Yaakov. But there's sometimes he'll, he'll say, I'm the Elohim, and then there's the, the way it's pronounced or spelled is this. Because the letter Lamed, which means unto or regarding, Avraham, Aleph, Bet, Av, Resh, He, Mem. Avraham, and then there's Lamed, Yod, Zadi, Chet, Kuf, which would be unto Yitzchak, and then he says Lamed, Yaakov, which would be Yod, Ayan, Kuf, Bet. Now, if you see this in the verse, and it says, Oh, I am the Elohim of Abraham, of Yitzhak, and of Yaakov. Well, that's one way to read it, as a translation. But what I want to show you in this little video here is that there's a different way to read this. So again, going back to the Red Dictionary, let's look up Abraham. Well, if you look on page 4, you get the word spelled Aleph Bet Resh. So we're having this word taken as a word. Now, you can take He Mem as a suffix and it basically means them or they. It's basically the third person plural. Aleph as a suffix can be usually rendered as I am or I will dot 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 in which case you could take bet resh he as the verb. So there's a couple different ways to take this. Lamed basically as a prefix means unto, regarding, by, for, or in consideration of. But here, let's take this. Aleph bet resh in the dictionary here means pinions, limb, member, organ. It means to be strong, strengthened, hardened, to fly, and to soar. It also can mean the word lead. But here you have a picture of flying, soaring, and uh, remember the pinions are the main feathers of the bird wings, you know, eagle pinions, which give them the great lift to get up and fly. So it has to do with strong or strengthened, strengthened, strengthened wings, you might even say, strengthened wings. Now, if you look at the word for bet resh hay, you go to another page here, which would be page 82 in the Red Dictionary. It means to recover, restore, eat bread. It's He served a mourner with food after the funeral. But it also means to choose. It's related to Bet Resh Aleph, which means to be fat or recuperated or made healthy, which is actually the word used when he says in Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim, that word bara, bet resh aleph, means to recuperate or become fat, which is why some people believe that there's the reference of a pre-existing earth and its condition of being destroyed before he recuperated the earth, made healthy the exhausted condition previously, which is why when it says that the earth starts off, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, but he never says how he did that. He just goes on with, let there be light, and separating water from water, you know, the sequence of the seven days. Just so you know, that's where that comes from. But the root of these two words here, bet resh, is also paid on, found on page 82, and it means threshed grain or corn, pure and clean. Threshed corn is something where you've gotten all the husk off and all the chaff off and all the dirt out of it, and now you've got a, re, uh, a pure grain that you can use for cooking. 
for eating. It also means an open field, which is to lie uncultivated, which means there's no forest on it, there's not a crop on it, it's just lying there kind of wiped out and empty and clean. So this concept of bet resh is empty and clean, or if it has to do with choosing, then you could say choosing something that's been refined. Bet resh also means outside of or except, which means nothing else in consideration except for this. It is a word for bar, as in bar of metal, meaning if you take a rough piece of steel, like for example in carpentry, they used to make two by fours out of rough sawn wood, which is literally two inches by four inches, but then they sent them surfaced on four sides by a planer, and you get what we now get today, if you buy it in the hardware store, lumber yard, that's inch and a half by three and a half because it's been surfaced. It's been milled to specification. It's where we get the word bar. A bar of metal has been milled to specification. So hence a bar mitzvah. The word bar, bet resh aleph in Aramaic, is the word for son. You could say, oh, it's the son of the covenant because mitzvah are the instructions of the covenant. But it's more like here is a son who has been made clean and purified and selected per to gr the grade to the classification of pure and clean because he regards the instructions of the covenant. So that's what this bar means. So to look at this when he says, I am the Elohim unto Avraham, it's not just saying, oh, I am that guy's God, that guy's deity, that guy's Elohim, but he's saying, I promised him that I would recuperate you, you who choose my ways, Bet resh means to choose, bet resh, hey, if you choose me, I promise that I will recuperate you, strengthen you as with wings to rise up like an eagle and fly. Now that's a promise of the covenant given La Avraham. This word to La Yitzhak, the letter Yod is a prefix, but then you have the root of the word, which is Zadi Het Kuf. And if you look then on page 544, you'll see that the word simply Zadi Het, which is these two letters right here, means dazzling, glowing, bright, and clear. If you look at Zadi Het Kuf, you get to laugh. It also means he mocked and derided, sported, played, jested. It's basically smiling, having fun, laughing together, whether you're kidding around, whether you're goofing around, whether you're serious, whether you're... Remember there's a story that Ishmael sported with Isaac and Sarah, Isaac's mother, got upset because she saw that there was something more than just sporting. When, when kids are playing around with each other and being rude and making fun of, it's the same word as laughter. Isaac names means laughter. And my point is here, if you have this picture of dazzling, glowing, bright, clear, laughter, sporting, play, there's something about Yahweh saying, I'm going to recover you guys from your sadness, from your demise, from your erosion, as we read in Deuteronomy, like, oh gosh, how long we're going to have to put up with this misery. He, this is a promise to restore us to the place of hilarious laughter. And you might almost say, boy, when you're not having a great occasion, like typically, at least in America, you've got New Year's Day or Fourth of July or a big celebration, you send fireworks off. When you see something exploding in the sky that everybody goes, oh, hey, look at that. And this name, Yitzchak, is, is like this fireworks of laughter going off in the sky as for Abraham and unto Yitzchak. Now, when you get to Yaakov, that's the name otherwise translated as Jacob, otherwise known as James in the New Testament, but it's really Yaakov. And if you, again, the Yod being the prefix letter, if you look at Ayin Kuf Bet, and that's back on page 481 in the Red Dictionary here. And it means to follow at the heel, circumvent, overreach, supplanted, superseded. Now people say, that sneaky snake, Jacob, he's always trying to get what was, belongs to his brother Esau, to reach out and grab what was his. There was another picture where in the womb, Esau was trying to kick Yaakov in the head, and Yaakov put up his head and blocked him and grabbed the held of his heel. But when he came out and he was grabbing Esau's heel, that's why he said, oh, heel catcher. Because this has to do with that which follows you is a footprint. That's what this word means. So it also means heel and footprint. And because the yod is the hand that was grabbing the foot, it's like, oh, he's a heel catcher. He's a supplanter. But this also means steep, crooked, and insidious and deceitful. It's like, yeah, that's, 
them Jews, you know, they got these nasty, sneaky, deceitful. That's what people have been told, and so that's what people think. <clears throat> but it also means a buzzard. Why? Because it sits up on a high place. The word akov also means consequence because of or that which follows at the heel of somebody. If you add the letter he to the end of this word, Yakova, it literally means the trace, the track, or the wake of a ship. Now what this actually is saying is, it, well, let me say one other thing. Kuf bet is where we get the word cube. Now in, in Arabic, I know they have this thing called the uh, Kaaba, which is a cube, which is this big box that has to do with their worship. The word cube means to put something into the third dimension, to raise up. Well, remember that comic book story of Superman? He could jump over tall buildings in a single bound. That's what this is a story of. And what this is saying is that Yahweh has promised that that which follows you, if I am your Elohim, I will restore you. I will cause you to fly like hilarious laughter, and you will jump up over your obstacles supplanting, overreaching all hindrances which your enemies might put on you. And the thing which is so sneaky is not that Yaakov had this attitude of insidious deceit, but that Yahweh will give him the ability to go to steep, crooked places. The word Az is a goat, and it also means splendor, glory, daring, might, bold, dynamic, sharp. It's like, wow, look at what they're doing. And that's the promise Yahweh gave to Yaakov to reach up over, to jump up over, unto flying through the sky with hilarious laughter because Yahweh being his Elohim, he will give him the victory over all his adversaries as per the covenant if we would just go back to the terms of the covenant which is what the story of the Tanakh is all about. You read, even Yeshua said, when his disciples said, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's like, what, do they want a, a magic thing to happen? It has nothing to do with magic. He said, you know the terms of the covenant. Are you the great teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, and you don't know these things? Of course you know these things. Keep the terms of the covenant, you get blessed. These are the blessings. Unto Abraham, unto Yitzhak, and unto Yaakov. The terms of the blessings is that you will be strengthened, recuperate, you will be the chosen people, and you'll fly like wings of an eagle. And it'll be your hilarious laughter as well as Yahuwah's hilarious laughter like fireworks going off, and you will be able to soar over two-dimensional obstacles like Superman jumping over tall buildings. There'll be nothing to you. But if you don't keep the terms of the covenant, It'll be your demise. It'll be your subjection. It'll be you having your face shoved into the dirt and dragged along behind your enemies, which has happened up until this day. And for the Jews, all through the history of the planet, to be the only people group to ever hold on to that promise is to their great regard, not to their shame. It's, thank you very much, Brother Yehuda for keeping the hope of this promise alive so that we of the various other 11 scattered tribes of Israel could remember that you have not forgotten those words of promise in spite of all the various other religions which have tried to demand of you otherwise, that have tried to tell you to throw away your trust and hope in Yahweh being your Elohim and restoring his favor to our nation, the 12 tribes of Israel. You, brother Yehuda, have kept that dream alive. You have kept the hope in these words of Torah that we in these days, just like in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we can come back and say, yes, it is so. Just as Yahweh said, he gave us the curse as we deserved. And now we take up this hope, this lively hope, coming boldly before the throne of grace saying, Yahweh, you said you would give us back the covenant, the kingdom, and life. Chaim and Aolam. You said you would give it back to us. Thanks to Yeshua Hamashiach who bought us back oh, from our yeah. filth, from our contact with the dead, and with the pagan neighbors that we frolicked with. He washed us clean so we could come back to the kingdom, pick up HaTorah, sit down on Shabbat, and fellowship with Yahweh Eloheinu. Thank you, Brother Yehuda. Okay, so here's a challenge to you other 11 tribes. What are you supposed to be doing? Let's get at it. We've got a whole kingdom in front of us and possibly a thousand years. Let's fight. Shalom. Let's argue. Let's 
argue about how the name is pronounced. Let's argue about the moons. Let's argue instead of grabbing hold of the covenant. And by the way, Eric, we want it to be this generation, don't we? I have found verses. I don't have them off the top of my head to tell you where they are. This but God seems to say, I have offered this promise to every generation. And if the generation, individuals at large, if they choose not to take me up on my offer, well, the Pass blessings will be held in abeyance and passed on to offer to the next generation. And if they forsake them, passed on to the next generation. May it so be forth, this generation. Until some generation will sit there and say, hey, we will step up and do this. Let's we will turn it. back from our Babylonized, pagan, blending, melding of various religious roots and observances and traditions, and we will return. The word return is teshuva, but also there's a, there's a verse, another interesting study, it says when you have returned, then you will so forth and so on. And the word that says when you have returned is spelled shin bet tav, which is the word Shabbat. And I found it interesting to say, you know, it's interesting that the very word that says when you have returned is the word Shabbat, and what is the sign that you have returned? You observe Shabbat. So all those people that say, yeah, we don't have to keep Shabbat, we can do it whenever we want, you can do anything you want. I'm not telling anybody that they have to do anything. What I'm saying is the scriptures indicate that when you have returned to the words of HaTorah that he gave to Moshe on Mount Sinai, as per Deuteronomy chapter 30, which I would encourage you to go back and read, you might want to read it in cahoots with Deuteronomy 29, that the evidence that you have indeed returned is that you regard Shabbat by sitting down on the seventh day as prescribed, not as the one that was convoluted and, you might say, uh, imposed by humanity under the guise of being the vicar of Christ on earth, a.k.a. the ecclesiastical authority of the church. That's another story, but I'm just saying the Torah is very clear. It's the seventh day. Other people have made it very clear that they changed it to the first day to show that they had verbal authority in themselves which supersedes the authority of the written word. And this is going back to the words of the Torah as given to Moshe as it says in Deuteronomy 30. Which is brought to our attention by Yeshua's conversation with Nakalamon in John chapter 3. And the subject of that was all about gaining the kingdom which had to do with eternal life. This is all about not only how to live now but how to live after this phase of consciousness passes on to the next, past that veil of death. There's much to this. But remember he said, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Do not lift up his name unto vanity, which is to say emptiness or void, because he will not hold that man guiltless who does so. If we lift up his name as if it's light, and this is nothing, this is worthless, this is to be despised and rejected. I believe what he's telling us is that what will be dumped on us or imposed upon us in the eternal regard is the same attitude about us will be poured on us as we render attitude to his name here and now. I mentioned John 3.16. You might say the other side of that is that the most significant verse, you might say, in the Old Testament is in Malachi chapter 3.16. John 3.16, Malachi 3.16.